Welcome to the Beyond the Reef podcast, where I talk to experts and researchers in the reef aquarium hobby, discussing a broad range of topics from corals and reef biology to water chemistry and equipment. We take a deep dive into our guests' methods, techniques, and top reef keeping tips. My name is Adam Sutherland, and I am the owner operator of Frag Garage Corals, based out of British Columbia, Canada. So my guest for this episode is Claude Schumacher of Fauna Marin, and you definitely know the Fauna Marin line. Claude is a very ambitious guy. He's got a farm going. He's got one of the best reef ICP labs in the world. He's also just an extremely knowledgeable guy, and I had questions that have kind of built up over the last I'd say the last three or four episodes, just things bouncing around in my head, and I was able to address the majority of this stuff with Claude, although I feel like I need to have him back on to uh, really dig a little deeper into some of it. There's a couple times in the episode I'd say that Claude's accent is uh, a little bit hard to understand. Um, Just maybe go back, review, and you should be able to catch it. I did catch it at least on the second time he said things, so uh, it shouldn't be too hard for you to follow. Thanks to the direct support of hobbyist Bobby Heath, I'm happy to bring this podcast to you absolutely ad-free. If you want to support us, the best things you can do are like, share, write us a review, and definitely subscribe. Not enough people are hitting subscribe. And if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for future guests, please reach out. If you want to help us with a monthly contribution, you can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash beyond the reef. Okay, so let's get into this conversation with Claude Schumacher of Fauna Marin. Okay, all right. Well, (laughs) thanks for joining me, by the way. I appreciate you making some time. I know you are very busy with, uh, I mean, running Fauna Marin. You got a farm, you got an ICP lab. It's a lot, I bet. Yeah, it's it's okay. So it grows over the years, um, but it's usually that in December, January, we have a lot of um, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of tax and all the things, so it's uh, sometimes uh, a challenge uh, yeah. during the uh, during that time. And summer is mostly better. Yeah, I bet. Well, and it sounds like you're a passionate hobbyist too. So it's like, you know, it's your your passion and your work. <laughs> you probably get a little burnt out on it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a passion, surely, but. Um, yeah, it becomes a job also. Yeah, so it's uh, I'm not that often in the farm and play around with the core. So it's becoming, unfortunately, it becomes very rare. Mm-hmm. So mostly nowadays it's a lot of his bureaucracy and uh, even Germany is um, completely strange in these things in chemistry, biology, food, even mm-hmm. lab stuff. So and uh, people today, they think it's not a problem to send water uh to a country but even when water cross a country it's a question of national security for yeah. the, the countries it's totally weird um but uh, these are the challenges yeah. nowadays to run a company and i think every company in the world knows that yeah has this uh, for sure and it sounds uh, like there's some stricter guidelines in germany and parts of europe as far as like things like antibiotics um you know, probably certain oh. chemicals that we use in our tanks are harder to get or export. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it's totally forbidden. So we are not able to sell or use like fluconazole or amoxicillin mm-hmm. or like with the problems what we have now with all the bacteria stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we we always, but that's since many, many years, it's like that, that we need to search um, other possibilities, other uh, products or ways how to deal with uh, illnesses or with parasites or with all the stuff and it's two sides of a metal so on the one side yeah it's a problem because we don't have really good products which we can use mm-hmm. so on the other side it's a really big problem uh, that we cannot um, it's a big problem when you use this medicine uh, which goes then down to the to the water, goes in the rivers, and getting some resilience and antibiotic, antibiotics and that stuff. So, I can sometimes understand why it's so uh, why it's forbidden. So, if you see in the mm-hmm. even in the U.S., which is quite uh, popular to use the bio mm-hmm. uh, stuff, this bio stuff is 
that toxic and dangerous that uh, me personally I cannot understand how people can use it at home. Yeah, so, yeah. And I mean, just, actually, this was one of my notes was to get into talking about the use of antibiotics in the States. But I mean, the big question for me is uh, like, what are alternatives to like improving the microbiome of our corals without having to use any of these kind of tools? Because I mean, if we can dose bacteria and get certain trace elements in a certain range, like I would hope that it would not be necessary at all. The problem is the problem is a little bit the question where these uh, bacteria disease is coming from. Mm -hmm. So parasites and other stuff we had since long time. Yeah. So that's really nothing new or special or something which is now more worse than before. Mm -hmm. The actual problem coming after the Malaysian market opens or the, the Ophelia coming and the Acropora coming, then it spread. Uh, this bacteria disease seems to spread completely out of Europe, Asia, and even in the, in the US or in the North America area. Um, there's no wonder that this happens because the sources are quite the same. So if, this, if the source is in Indonesia or from the export station and all these uh, parts, then it's clear that it will land it in all over the world because mm -hmm. they, they export these cores all over the world. I have another opinion to this um, situation. In my opinion, actually, the problem is that we do way too much dipping and way too much uh, treatment on the cores. Mm -hmm. Uh, it started in the facilities in Indonesia that they use a neomycin sulfate, but in a really high amounts. To, I think that they they try to protect the cords, but in fact, with this all these antibiotics, they also destroy the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly known that as soon as we destroy some specific bacteria on the microbiome and the skin of the cords, uh, viper disease can spread up, which is a normal standard thing. Mm -hmm. And um, with every tip what we do, with every specific things like iodine and, 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 and all the things what we find out, oils, the all the citron oils and, 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 and uh, neem oil, whatever is used in all these dips is so mm -hmm. dangerous because it is it, it kills bacteria. But how can a dip know which bacteria I have to kill? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it doesn't work at the end. I had these type of dips oils uh, before and I find out that they work not that good against the parasites and we have more and more problems how more often we dip. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. dip the cores, we put them back in a tank and it seems that something is, is not okay. So it, it was not adjustable, uh, it was not to find with ICP or with a standard water test, it was a feeling. And we, I had some years ago, I have these small mucus uh, layers on it and, and the cords, uh, some of the cords dying. And we didn't know why till mm -hmm. we find out how more we dip, how more problems we have. So we changed the dips. Mm -hmm. And um, But the type of dipping is that what increases the last two, three, four years massively. Absolutely. So everybody yeah. dip. And I have so much feedback of people asking me uh, how often I should dip the cords. So which course you want to dip, how often? Yeah, when they stand in the aquarium. So I have fear that they get something. So I I dip them. Yeah. Uh, but I think they are healthy, so they have nothing. No, they're healthy, so then don't dip them. Yeah. So <laughs> as as long as I don't have a headache, I will not take a pill. So and um it is it becomes weird that uh, that uh, people dipping that all and all and all the time. On the other side, um Nowadays, the course costs a lot of money. And there's a lot of dealers out of the market who export or import the course and they sell it at the next day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It is easy to make a lot of money on that. And even if there's a yeah. new strain of affilia, a few hundred bucks, so why, why choose the risk? So everybody tries to do it, makes it easy and fast, sell it fast, and then ah, it's the problem of, of the hobbyist. Yeah. And I criticize also a little bit. I criticize also the dealers. Started from the export station using antibiotics, then mm -hmm. comes to the transport. Then they put every core from every t part of the world together, which is yeah. even a thing which is absolutely not professional. Yeah, I have been then, curious about that too, um, but we can touch yeah. on that. Yeah. Then they have they take not the time for four, six, or eight weeks in quarantine station, mm -hmm. take care that the water is perfect, that they have a good food, and take one or two out, dip them, let the rest in. So this is 
this becoming not popular anymore. That was clear that we do that before, and I know a lot of good stores who still do that. Yeah. And but with that type of work, they need a little bit more money on the core, and they are under pressure about all the basement stores selling cords for fast, fast, fast. Yeah. And nobody understand why a torch, um, holy grail, this one at one store costs a fifty bucks more than the other one. Yeah. But eight weeks of work nowadays with all the energy costs and all the other things raising up is an expensive thing. So, and that's a mixture of uh, trying to keep the core safe, uh, but not for a long time view, for a short time view, and a combination between the transports. And that's something which goes, in my opinion, goes totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And it is wrong that we put all the antibiotics in, or like uh, I said, biotip, because it is unbelievable that it's not understand that the skimmers will transport all this medicine, this chemical, this uh, uh, chemicals out into the living room where I live and transport it with the aerosols which we are producing in the skimmer out mm -hmm. in the room. Mm -hmm. And I cannot, I, I, I cannot understand why, why people uh, toxify themselves with uh, with uh, neurotoxins like the biotip. Yeah, it is, it is crazy in my opinion. So what would you say, like, if someone is dipping? Like, I think your main dip i guess it's called the dip right <laughs> it's yeah. is it more of a potassium based dip it's not like an oil That's, pine kind of oil base it's a potassium base right it, exactly it's a potassium based tip cost potassium uh works absolutely great against mm -hmm. the bugs yeah there is some specific reason why this is um a good thing um pure potassium does not work it's okay it's good mm -hmm. it has some uh points which are not as that good so you need to add some more minerals and you can also add some organic compounds which works them better against worms or spiders mm -hmm. um, but the, the most thing is all the bugs that we have the gamma reeds which eating acroporas or uh, isopods against the icons a sample or um, uh, the the uh, dog nuts there we have the problem that these creatures can handle toxins very easily Mm -hmm. So they know that from the environmental, from the corals, that they have to deal with a lot of different and very potential um, toxins. So what they do then, they can cut off the nervous system. So they shut it up mm -hmm. and then they produce inside uh, antidote against these toxins. Mm -hmm. After that, they run away. So, But meanwhile, these oils destroying the bacteria, the microbiome from the corals and uh, let then the coral die over the time. And it's not no more the parasites, it's the missing bacteria and the growing of the vibrio, which causes then the death of the corals over yeah. longer time. Yeah. N not in the first two, two, three days, but in the next weeks. Yeah. So if you were going to try to improve the microbiome of a coral, uh, what would be some approaches to that? Because like it sounds like Obviously, the microbiome is going to be compromised from dipping, probably worse from those oil-based kind of dips like Revive Coral RX compared to like a potassium-based dip. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not sure on that. But if you were to sort of, I don't know, have any pointers to just making a healthier microbiome, would you say it's like a, a bacteria-related thing or is it a combination of, of everything? I think we can compare that is a little bit the same situation like we have as humans also. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have issues with our bacteria, which living on the skin or in um, in our stomach, uh, we will have a really bad days and really uh, problems with that. So, mm -hmm. and everybody's a little bit different. So, and that's, I think is one of the biggest problems which we have with the cores nowadays, yeah. that we don't understand this microbiome really. It is so complicated. We even don't understand the human microbiome. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. we how we should understand uh, two hundred different type of cords, and even when they come from other areas, they have a different type of microbiome. Yeah, yeah. We try nowadays to improve the microbiomes with probiotic bacteria. So mm -hmm. and specific that works quite good um, and it's helpful. And the way to do it is that we uh, provide these animals that much on uh, specific and that much of bacteria strain, uh, stra uh, strains, which um, has the English word for it, the right one, he, they push the pathogens away. 
So they let not the space for Vipro to grow, and yeah. that helps the core to, to grow up. But the control of the, the microbiome, I would not say that we have any specific tool yeah. uh, to increase massively the flower bacteria or this one or this one or this one. Yeah. We tried it. We tried it with some products, like we have one with just a cover, um, cover vitalizer, or, mm -hmm. um, which is designed to to help the bacteria to improve. Yeah. Which, with that knowledge, what we have now. So good food, fatty acids, the right amount of carbon source, um, with long molecules as specific as uh, the food the bacteria take in and use it and and change that then to the food for the for the corals. Mm -hmm. But I also see how more we play around with that, how and how deeper we go, how less we understand. And sometimes the product works great and then the next coral it works not. Yeah. So we we did not have an industry at the moment a clear knowledge about the microbiome of yeah, all Yeah, because different. there isn't really a way to test the microbiome other than really visual inspections, you know, because unless you're actually swabbing the coral and sending it off <laughs> to a <laughs> lab or something like that, it's like, how, how would we really know? But I think like, you know, you have some bacteria products like the Bactotherapy uh, is one that I dose in my system. And I don't know how much of a difference it makes, but I don't think it's doing anything bad. Like in my opinion, it's either it's either helping the system and helping cultivate some of those good strains of bacteria or, you know, that bacteria is just kind of just going into the mix and not doing a lot. I'm not sure. But and obviously it might it's probably doing some nitrification as well. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, like um because you have quite a few bacteria products, so obviously, like you know, they're designed for specific things. Like we, yeah, but this is these are the classical bacteria. So mm -hmm. nitrification bacteria, denitrification bacteria, bacteria who take the sludge out, bacteria who uh, who destroy uh, typical color stra uh, color bodies in the water, or long organic molecules break them up. So this is something which we can buy from the industry. Mm -hmm. So we we can go to this company. We can say, hey, we have uh, we need denitrification bacteria. We need that one. And the uh, difference is how many different type of bacteria you put in the bottle, and how many cells you put in the bottle. Mm -hmm. So usually, when it's produced, is it's like a mucus, and then it depends on the company if they dilute it by factor two hundred or by factor two. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one sample. There's um, it's a. Uh, product which is uh, can, a little bit compared to ours uh, after the description what they made they use uh, there for one doses you need 30 milliliters by uh, 100 liters and ours use 3 milliliters for 100 liters mm. so and on bacteria it's very important uh, to know how many bacteria are in the bottle and which type of bacteria are in the bottle mm -hmm. and for what reason we use that so that's we have the back to blend this is a standard product uh, there are many on the market on that but it's it's highly concentrated and we have two strains of bacteria in who go who to destroy organic compounds where are phosphate inside mm -hmm. so that we get the depot effect back mm -hmm. so then we have the therapy therapy works quite great against pathogen bacteria it uh, cl cleans the, the aquarium for bad order and also sludge. The uh, rebiotic is a type of probiotic bacteria which is extremely strong. So this mm -hmm. is something when you have really big problems and you need to revitalize the aquarium. Yeah, I've then used you that product that. A, a few times. Yeah, yeah definitely. But it's extremely strong. So in, yeah. a, in a nice running aquarium, to dose that is like you're completely healthy and you take medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's also not a good idea. Um, and now the new one is the wipe X, uh, which is against the viper bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, specific probiotic bacteria on a carrier material, because we wanted to have the bacteria inside the corals, so yeah. that they can also clean the corals from inside there. Um, so you have to mix it, you have to activate the, the spores mm -hmm. on it, and together with extremely fine cuts, uh, uh, calcium carbonate particles which are a little bit um, prepared so that the spores laying around mm -hmm. the cords can take it in I see. because yeah. when you put pro probiotics 
only in the water, you have a half the problem that they clump together and the skin will take them out. Mm-hmm. And so we need them to stay in the water column. That's why we use the, the, the carrier material. Okay. Um, that will be also skimmed out a little bit, but they yeah. go in the bottom, they go to the cores, and they can absorb by the cores. Yeah. Those cores use that fine particles, and then it's, that's the benefit. Okay. The yeah, that's interesting, because I was going to ask if corals take in bacteria via their polyps or if some of the bacteria is absorbed through the tissue. You know, or say an acropora or something. Does some of it just get absorbed on the surface or, you know? Yeah, let me say... Um, I think that you will, if you ask this question, you will have a different ways of uh, answering. So if you answer a company like us who produce that, 100% every, every bacteria will be taken by the polyps. Mm-hmm. So um, a scientist will say, oh, it depends on which type of bacteria, which type of cores you have. Mm-hmm. In fact, I must say, we don't know 100%. So yeah. we cannot say yet uh, that every coral, every bacteria, everything will be will be go in what mm-hmm. we can do is what i do is that we check if the particles will be taken so the calcium carbonate particles that i can measure that i can see yeah, uh, yeah. by by i can open a polyp i can see the particle what i cannot see at are, are the different type of bacteria that's impossible yeah with our method what we have so what i see is that corals taking these very small calcium particles inside and we put the bacteria on it so that with that we are be sure that they are in yeah i cannot see that really properly so we know that the corals take bacteria in also for food but we cannot say actually which one they prefer, which one not, yeah, and which yeah. species. To well, another interesting sort of uh, thing to think about, um, it's something that a, a few of us have been kind of experimenting with. I'm, I'm kind of trying to call it bacteria-infused feeding. Uh, so feeding coral foods that have sat or sort of marinated in, in tank bacteria for a certain amount of time and then feeding that coral food saturated in that bacteria. I wonder if that is, you know, possibly an avenue to get that bacteria delivered to the corals better what you what you understand with tank bacteria what do you mean with that exactly um i'm talking about a product like bactotherapy or something like that like something Ah, you know that you know you would use you know generally Um, you would just add it to the tank but in this case you're adding it to your coral food you know in a separate container with your tank water mixing it up letting it sit and then and then feeding the corals okay uh, for that i need to go one step back okay so when we talk about food and let me say some people using frozen food uh here in europe uh when we do the testing about rapio so we have some institute there so we ship our corals there we ship samples there and let them test uh what do we find in bacteria? so in usa is sometimes um these biomics uh, who do the testing. Here we have several institutes. Mm-hmm. The problem is now how they test. If I food, if I feed um, mussels, so then it's 100% sure that in these mussels you will find Vibrio fortis or Vibrio uh, mediterranea. That's some specific Vibrio bacteria. Mm-hmm. Why they found it? They find it because they have the right primer for that to use it in the PCR machine. If you don't have the right primer, you cannot find maybe the the vibrio which is on the coral because they mm-hmm. look only on them. Mm-hmm. If I ship now the sample to the US, they have the primers uh, for aquaculture, for the standard testing, what they have there. And if I feed now uh, Australian or uh, uh, food from Alaska, um, then I will f- then the PCR find a short genetical piece. They will uh, they will um, find that and will say yes, we found this vibrio, but mm-hmm. it means definitely not that in this case it was pathogen. That it was pathogenic. This, yeah. Yeah, pathogenic, right? Yeah. We have no idea about what we find there and how much it was in, because that's the way how we detect it. That's, that's a little bit the same when we do an ICP test and it comes out, yeah, there's there's an aluminum inside. Mm-hmm. It depends wh- which type of aluminum I have in, if it's if it's good or not. Mm-hmm. So you need always, after testing, you need an interpretation. So you need to find out, okay, what a problem I have? What is in food inside? Did the guy feeding this food or this food? Yeah. Because the point is, corals take the food that's definitely sure mm-hmm. and it will be definitely helpful 
to use that food, but preparing is probiotic bacteria, which is the rebiotic or the new YBX. Mm -hmm. The bactotherapy, bactoplant, and other bacteria um, products, which are on the market, which I know now from Europe more than from the US, uh, they does not contain automatically probiotics. They contain um, specific bacteria for nitrate, ammonia, and, uh, and that stuff. Okay. They are not helpful. These are also not the typical bacteria which corals take in. Yeah. But with probiotics, it will be definitely a good help and definitely help the corals to get avoid uh, from to get to get uh, avoid from a strong vibrant diseases or the risk to get an infection. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what did you say? So you said it's the the um, rebiotic, and it's what, what what do you say was the name of the bacteria that was the Vibrio? Um, it's YPX. Yeah, it's the name of it. We are B and then across. Is that on the uh, North American market yet? Because I don't know if it's on it yet. It's on the way. Okay, cool. Well, that's good to know because uh, that's one I would probably use <laughs> for sure. But, but yeah. this is this is now specific. So these probiotics, which are there inside, are specific against the vibrio disease. What we have found mm -hmm. on corals. It means not that we can that it will help in any case, because I think, in my opinion, we have quite different bacteria strains actually which make the problems. Yeah. So, because um, the aquabiomics find the aquabacteria, uh, we never find this in Europe, which is, uh, for me, quite difficult, because we make tests from the same farm, we, we, we send them to the US, we send them to Europe, we, take at the same time samples, mm -hmm. we find the Rafrio and aquabiomics find the aquabacteria. And first of all, we need to find out and I need to talk with them and talk with the institutions on which way they, on which way they test, what method they use for testing that, and which primers they have to find a different type of bacteria. And mm -hmm. the institutes don't have usually the primers to find this typically uh, reef bacteria and corals, so they find for aquaculture for fish, but not that what we have. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's the problem what we are in now. Well, so here's kind of a thought on that is carbon sources. And I was having a conversation with someone else that kind of pointed me to the idea that certain carbon sources may be more likely to feed some of the bacteria strains that might be the ones we want versus the ones we don't want. Um, I don't know if you have any opinions on that, but um, you know, he's, he's, he's hundred percent right. Yeah, definitely. This is the point. Uh, unfortunately would be good to know that which one is exactly for which bacteria. Like I said before, in fact, we don't have any idea mm -hmm. about it. We have some experience. Yes. And we play around and research it and we talk and we, we can read hundreds of studies, but always there is the problem. Most of the studies, if you read them and you can see them, they have a, they have a blank aquarium. There's Stylophora in or Potiopora in, and then they look only on the carbon sources, but they don't take care of all the water parameters around. Mm -hmm. So that's why I cannot compare it to a running aquarium with food coming in, fish coming in, and have a tons of aquarium, tons of corals from every different um, places where they come from. Yeah, where I have no idea what is the bacteria complex in into this aquarium, and then. Which is in the one, which in one aquarium, let me say you, you give a carbon source like a standard sugar, which works well, mm -hmm. is, is in another aquarium, uh, a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. So that makes them so difficult. So I'm sure he's right. I have the same opinion that the way and the type of which different carbon source we work, which we do in our products, mm -hmm. but we see that they are beneficial over all cores, but to but to fully understand which one exactly on which part of bacteria is helpful, mm -hmm. eh, I would not say that we know that. Yeah. I mean, interesting, though, like with your lab and your farm, like you kind of have the ability to to play with some of these things, I guess. But is the farm does the farm have a lot of separate systems where you can really experiment or is it more that like, you know, the farm is like some some larger systems that, you know, you'd have to treat the entire system. You can't really just play around with some small you know, focus group kind of thing. Um, the farm by itself had eight different systems. We yeah. have some smaller aquariums where most of the stuff is breeded there. And so we test out the products and the ideas over 
uh, standard farm work. So mm -hmm. the farm runs now. This farm, which in this company where we stay now, is since 2006, mm -hmm. running around. The most tanks running since deck since them 24/7. Uh, before I had a, I started in '84 with uh, coral working. Wow! <laughs> but <laughs> what's days. more, what's more uh, interesting for me is uh, with our ICP and with our consulting a sample, we um, we support the World Coral Conservation Program. So, which is in mm -hmm. all different type of aquariums, or the Florida Conservation Program, where we do also the ICP testing and uh, do consulting with all the people working on the corals to help them to grow them, to breed them, and to bring them under good shape. Mm -hmm. And there, we have a lot of information. So, the, the good thing what I have is uh, we do actually around 500 tests a day in the ICP. Uh, we have around 180,000 tests, which uh, which databases which I can use, mm -hmm. and there we find very fast. We can find out. Um, let me say a few thousand customers telling over the world, yes, I have problems with my cords, I have this mucus, mm -hmm. or I have dinos, or I have cyanobacteria, and then yeah. I can let run our artificial intelligence about it to find out uh, if my feeling is also uh, approved by data, and. That helps us a little bit on it. And, yeah, that's um, interesting because every time you're getting tests in and you're consulting with with these customers, you're you're taking in data and you're learning from it. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I've seen the prediction uh, system on your your ICPs, and and uh, I think that's 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 pretty cool. Like, um, I think you know it'd be nice to I don't know it'd be nice to see more companies doing that, but I guess that's an advantage you guys have <laughs> in, in your product. I think um, our advantage is and our good thing is that I, it was never the plan to build a company. Mm -hmm. So my plan to build Fauna Marine was to build a station in the Philippines and, and, and import and export uh, different type of uh, fishes and corals and building coral farms on the Philippine side. And that does not work that <laughs> proper like I wanted. And so later then we decide uh, to to do a marketing with our products. I even do products at this time, but I give it to other companies and I was a little bit in the background, so mm -hmm. I do not make my own company because I wanted to be in the Philippines. So I learned in this time a lot of about uh, coral reefs um, and farming into the open sea. And then when I come back to Germany, then I decide uh, to do that on my own. This was 2001. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to do the products. and. The experience what I have and how we work and it's still the heart of the company is the coral farm. So mm -hmm. we are coral farmers. We mm -hmm. we are not a company uh, starting six years ago uh, looking in China and whatever. It's like okay, give me some products, make make my brand on it, and then sell it. Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit the difference. There are some companies in the market today who has the same background like we have. So they starting as coral guys. Yeah, and still today they're acting like that. You can, you can absolutely see that mostly uh, they need many years till they come to a size. They have a little, still a little bit uh, very specific marketing. It is focus on corals, mm -hmm. and then you have all the other companies which uh, in two three years they have uh, two hundred products ready, and everything is yeah. the best and <laughs> nice marketing and and people running around and uh, a lot of influencer and after four or five years then later everybody knows ah okay but the salt is dirty or the product doesn't work as that good and then they they go back to these old companies which which works i think yeah yeah we we are still hobbyists like you say so that's why yeah. i say mm, at the beginning uh, at the end in my heart yes we are fully hobbyists but on the other side it is it's 20 years the job and yeah. it's it's a bit, it, it's really weird for us that we take more concerns about the sticker nowadays and and uh, getting all the laws and, and, and all the bureaucracy yeah. instead of make the product and spend every power what we have into the quality of the product yeah so and say who, who takes care how how looks the sticker <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter it's important what's inside yeah and i think i was hearing that your team you have like several phds working in your lab um do you want to give me a, like yeah. a little breakdown of the kind of the the some of the major roles that you have working for you? <clears throat> um, if a company grows and like me now also, and I want to start to um, do ICPs, so then 
we start, we see that the new technology is coming. And then I said, hey, let us buy a machine. We put mm-hmm. it there. And then he said, okay, where's the on-off? So, <laughs> yeah, <that's> how- <laughs> which it was that easy, hey? <laughs> Yeah, that was easy to find. The rest yeah. becomes a little bit more complicated later then. And yeah. since the last 10 years, we learn, we learn every day. But uh, then you have some, um, uh, then just some stuff there who has a study in biology. Mm-hmm. And then you take step by step, you take people in. So the last one then is, uh, he has a PhD, is, uh, Max is, uh, has a PhD in organic chemistry. Mm-hmm. So, and... Uh, Sure, I can read a lot and I can do my own research. Yeah. Sure. But if you work then with somebody later and you you show them the recipes and they bring the the studied knowledge in organic chemistry and say, hey, if you change that there and if you do the molecule on there, the product is more stability. This is a really great help. Mm -hmm. Um, he, He cannot do... He's not an aquarium guy, so he cannot yeah. say what is for core good. And our work is, as development is that we have to get knowledge over many, many, many different ways, from the chemistry to the biology mm-hmm. to the product safety, uh, even w- with all the material you use. And you cannot use every bottle for every trace element. Yeah. So we cannot go in, into the deep. I go into the deep what I like and what I want to know that are in some specific corals or parasites and uh, this bacteria type now, but on the same time, I cannot be a perfect chemist or I cannot be a perfect uh, um, yeah. uh, specific biology reason, so I have to read that. Yeah, remind and me what your background is again. Bro- what, what? Um, I'm I am carpenter. <laughs> You're carpenter? The, okay, but, but yeah. as far as your science background? Um, I have no science background no? in this case, no. so, but okay. I'm, no, absolutely not. I have, uh, I do carpenter. Yeah. I worked some years for different universities in sponge breeding and uh, built for them the stations and I do some research with them together so I know how it works. Yeah. And I was uh, some years in University of Stuttgart and in Karlsruhe and t- technical biology, So, but I worked for them, yeah. which is yeah. not a study. So and um, Yeah, but that's a lot of hands-on learning, right? Like first-hand experience. Yes, and the most thing I must say I learned during my times in the Philippines. So mm-hmm. we built uh, we built an uh, export station. We do training with the fishermen. I write the standards for the MAC Aquarium Council, how to transport fishes. Mm-hmm. And I had a lot of time and had a lot of dives. Uh, it was boring, and I ca- I I had the luck and the possibility to sit down in a reef and see. And yeah. have a look on, and yeah. see. Oh, corals eating a lot, and yeah. what they eat, that they eat. So, and um, yeah, it's experience. That's all. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty like special time in your life that you spent. You said five years in the Philippines. Three years. Yeah, three years. Yeah. A lot of times, go up and down. Sometimes stay longer than a few days, then go back, and so. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It was a was a great time. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, well, another kind of major subject I kind of wanted to dive into is nutrients. And I think, you know, something that this has come up on the podcast a couple times recently, and I I think you could probably give me some clarity on it. But I wanted to talk about the difference between organic and inorganic nitrates and how the bioavailability works with corals. Because, you know, if if I have a nitrate reading that became nitrate as a result of the entire nitrification process you know, from fish poop or whatever, versus Mm -hmm. adding a nitrate additive to get my nitrates, let's say to 10. Um, How does that affect the corals and how does it affect the bioavailability? You have very complicated questions today. (laughs) It's not easy to answer. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, Nitrogen. Nitrogen is the usual way what we know is ammonia, it goes to urea, and then it goes to nitrate, and it goes back. Yeah. Normal nitrogen cycle. On corals, it depends a little bit if there are more uh, on ammonia uh, part. So if you have a tank, which is very low nutrients, low nitrates, mm-hmm. you can feed them with ammonia. So mm-hmm. that they like more. Yeah. So Because what they use as a nutrient is ammonia and urea also. Yeah. But uh, there are also some cores over the time, they, they can decide to take on nitrate. So 
to reduce the nitrate and to use it as a, as a nutrient, they need some specific um, trace elements like molybdenum sample so that they can do the reduction and then they can use it. Mm -hmm. So if you put now a nitrate-based coral into a, a nitrate-free aquarium, which is full of ammonia, this coral will have some issues. Yeah. So because it goes not fast. The organic compound of different type of nitrogens is mostly that what is uh, what is um, binded like uh, carbon or like phosphate or long molecules, which like a sacred terpenes or terpenes or phenols and that stuff, which is therein. Usually corals cannot take that out. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for them. Yeah, so we'll say this organic phosphate and orthophosphate. Yeah, so because I've been kind of feeling like adding nitrate, like a nitrate additive, like sodium nitrate or potassium nitrate, it's it doesn't see like it'll get you a level that maybe puts your nitrates to a ratio to the phosphates that you like, <laughs> but is it really doing anything for the tank positive versus you know like you're saying the corals more just need the ammonia right, which is kind of way way down in the process so if you're just adding this final product of nitrate you know who's it helping is it just growing algae in the tank <laughs> that's not that's not the point on adding uh nitrogen yeah so it depends what is the situation in the reef tank now uh some tanks have a very high phosphate mm -hmm. but not a nitrate reading but corals stay nice. It's a lot of fish in, fishes and snails producing ammonia, and that should that looks like that at the moment for the corals that's enough nitrogen mm -hmm. so they can grow. But it's not enough that the phosphate goes down. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, it would be good to add a nitrate, like sodium nitrate. On other specific situation, it's better you use a nitrogen source, which is depending on ammonia, urea and nitrates together so to support the corals nitrogen and this situation when there's a night if there is a lack of nitrogen into the ground mm -hmm. mostly when the tank starts new no snails no fishes in yeah. and not a good high protein food that's a total different situation so that's that's also why i always said if you make an icp you need a supporter who can do interpretation mm -hmm. you see your tank you have to experience and say ah, i think in 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 your case, it would be better to add the nitrates, not the ammonia. Mm -hmm. If you if you go and that's one thing with the relations now. So yeah, if you put your tank in a relation by usual detection for nitrate and phosphate, so we call about the autophosphate, which you can do with the with the um, uh, test kit, and also with the nitrate by one to hundred, so one part phosphate to one uh, to one hundred parts of nitrate means yeah. if you have zero zero four phosphate you have four milligrams of nitrate yeah then the experience the the experience shows definitely that you don't have any big issues with algae growth cyanobacteria or something like that so yeah normally i would say only normally if you and in this case the nitrate adding can help a lot to bring it to normal relation then the cores can can take more upgrade and due to the reduction of nitrate they get the ammonia what they need so mm -hmm. then the nitrogen circle starts and also the phosphates go down mm -hmm. um, but i have surely about 10 different situations why i would choose a little bit of different way how to dose them mm -hmm. yeah well i mean in my situation um my nitrates will go to zero if i don't dose any nitrate but i have a lot of coral per gallon like my systems are loaded um, I see so, it, yeah. you know, but I do think that I think that feeding more and getting nitrates via, you know, that whole process seems to do, I, you know, my observation of other systems and people that have really successful tanks, they seem to have a nitrate reading that has occurred that way, as opposed to adding a nitrate product. Um, but you're saying that also adding the nitrate product like this, you know, sodium nitrate is going to help that ratio be in the right place too. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. And about your thing, what you talk about the most cores, if you have so fully loaded cores and have mm -hmm. the problem with, with the nitrate go to zero. Uh, very often the load of fish and snails 
and the way you feed mm -hmm. is too less of protein. So you need, you need, in this case, you need a lot of protein mm -hmm. and a specific part of food which don't produce a lot of phosphate and or uh, particleized phosphate. So if you feed food to the fish, usually you have a particleized phosphate which goes as fish poop out. Mm -hmm. And this is not direct available into the water, but it comes later back. It creates a depot. Mm -hmm. And this brings the disbalance. So if you have a food with over 75% of uh, protein and you adjust the skimmer a little bit more dry, mm -hmm. so you can you can push the way a little bit more to the nitri nitrogen uh, part. Mm -hmm. And if you're dosing wet and you do uh, uh, other type of food with a lot of fatty acids, then you reduce the phosphate better. Mm -hmm. uh, that this system works, need that the most of the dynamic elements, so like the zinc, vanadium, and this uh, specific uh, trace elements need to be on a, on a special ratio. Mm -hmm. If it's at a special ratio, if you have enough the halogens and the trace elements, the bacteria can also do the work as long as you give a little bit of this carbon sources in. The mm -hmm. carbon sources are then the key at the end uh, okay. for, the, for the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And this carbon sources in our way we have in the trace elements it is trace one two three which is in the balling method automatically mm -hmm. so in this case we dose the right amount of carbon source together with the need of alkalinity and calcium into the aquarium mm -hmm. so it is not depending to go by ethanol or something like that yeah so could a system be if it's a heavily stocked system be carbon source deficient is that sort of yeah. a common common thing yeah yeah definitely yeah. Yeah. And, the, you know, I've always kind of understood that a carbon source kind of helps, you know, even if it's doing nitrification, the byproduct of that is basically coral food or is more bioavailable uh, to the corals. Yeah, but yeah, yes and no. Yeah. So, um, you know, the vodka method. So yes, yes. If you use a carbon source like what we have in mind today, so uh, we use a vodka or, what, or whatever, uh, ethanol, methanol, like it's in some products, then you have the problem that you that you support some specific bacteria. So and uh, you're creating um, a lack of a diversity of bacteria because mm -hmm. the carbon source is too short. Look, today you find the nice reefs of. Uh, SPS reef and soft coral reef, you always find that the current goes away, the water flows to, to soft corals, and after that, a few hundred meters away, then other corals growing like wheat. So, of course, they use the sugars from the soft corals. Mm. And we know that also that some corals, they have a benefit from the sugars which we, which we release out of sponges, of soft corals. They need that for growing. And a good carbon source into a product is a long, uh, a long part, a long molecule. Yeah. So that you need a many different specific bacteria to break them up, and every bacteria gains their energy due to this work. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you have the right core of food. Yeah. Yeah. The ethanol, the vodka, the alcohol, or these easy sugars from C1 to C6 as a molecule, um, I'm not a fan of it. It yeah. is helpful. If, if had to go fast, but they are not that much available in in the seawater. In the seawater, the carb the carbon source in the seawater in these are long molecules, yeah. which need a lot of breakdown for bacteria. And this is for the corals on a long time view, way more efficient and more stability as the short ones. Yeah. So someone dosing vodka or or vinegar, one of those simple, cheap sugar sources might want to consider this a little bit because that those sources are probably a little more likely to feed some of the things we don't want to feed, I would think. Also, yeah. yeah. So even even a big problem, if you have the ripe your disease, mm -hmm. uh, if you, you, you really feed them and you fire them up, if you, if you have this ripe disease in a crime and you dose amino acids or simple available carbon sources, you really feed them up. So that's the yeah. first one you have to stop. Yeah, so aminos can potentially fuel some of those Vibrio and, Ups. and yeah. And yeah. Acropora flatworms. So they love Ooh. it. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to feed them any more than they're already No, <laughs> no. So uh, yeah. unfortunately, I really have to say this because um, it's because uh, so we sell us amino acids and mm -hmm. in the first few we will say, yes, please uh, give the the core power and give it yeah. uh, uh, strong that they can fight, but uh, it does not help. So, because it really fire up the worms, 
in this case, the right relations, the right nutrients, and the halogens and mm -hmm. uh, specific elements are helpful against the worms. Yeah. Okay, that's that's a good thing for people to keep in mind. Uh, okay, I got a little bit of a shift here, and um, our mutual friend Doug Dorrit had kind of put me onto this thinking. Doug from the UK, <laughs> and uh, you know he's a rather opinionated fellow, but uh, <laughs> he got me uh, thinking about the dangers of calc um, or calcium hydroxide. <laughs> and I just wondered because you don't use you don't. <laughs> That's funny that you're laughing, because Doug's going to watch this and see your response, but. Yeah. You don't really use calc in any of your products. It's not really part of a system that you support. Um, so can you kind of weigh in on that and sort of maybe compare it to some of the other sources of major elements? Yeah, um, um, in the, the last two months, I said in a video that I don't understand why sometimes somebody say, hey, I use calc, I have great results, and then uh, tons of people uh, changing their system if it's running well and mm -hmm. going to a system which we stopped 20 years ago. Yeah. So um, I said this only to show that uh, everybody have to look to this aquarium and think about if it makes sense or not uh, to use different type of methods. In Europe and um, here in Germany and Europe, uh, the Balling Light method is one of the market leader since many, many years and the most people coming back to the system. Uh, cause we developed that, that because we see some issues with calc water methods or with calcium reactors and others. Mm -hmm. So if you use the calc water singly, you have a big problem with precipitations. And I know that some American chemists say uh, this is not true, but we have to prove this ICP testing very long. You build up a calcium carbonate and a calcium carbonate and the particles, they catching uh, elements and bring them down into the surface and creating a depot effect. So people who are using a lot of uh, calc, they see it that all the surface is becoming a calcareous surface. Unlikely, it is not only calcium carbonate. It is uh, it is full with organic compound. It is full with trace elements, which are binded then in the bottom and on the surface. And as soon as the buffer system cannot work anymore, because with calcium, it don't give a real carbonate into the water, mm -hmm. then your tank crashes. And that was our experience 20 years ago, that it happens very often. So you get green hair algae, you have no fluorine, and all these necessary elements cannot be provided in the proper way. That's why we developed the bulling method, because there you put with the sodium B-carb, and it's important that you use the B-carb and not the other one. Yeah. There you, cre you put in the aquarium all the time the buffer system. And with uh, this calc, you don't have put this buffer system. So you need all the buffer system into the crumb that it can goes back from the carbon acid to the CO2 and back to the bicarbonate. So in the, in the, in the creation of the chemistry process. And that's the other thing is that we need a lot of space for calc water. Uh, we have a product which is a dangerous good and um, it's cheap. Yeah, that's, that's definitely mm -hmm. good. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but you back. need a lot of, <laughs> but you need a lot of space, and you need a lot of, of that stuff. So at the end, it was not cheaper than to using a calcium de, a calcium chloride dehydrate, and a proper alkalinity together. Yeah. Plus so, that you yeah. need to buy all the trace elements and the macro elements because you provide only calcium, and due to the buffer system, you create some alkalinity into your crown. Yeah. To so, get the, Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Together with the calcium reactor, so if you put the calc water together with the calcium reactor, that's a really good thing because the disadvantages of the calcium reactor, so adding too much CO2 in into the aquarium, will be covered by the calc water. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the calc is a really good thing. And to push, to use the calc as a push for um, a problem while growing, to to control the pH over a short time, it's a perfect thing. Mm -hmm. What I said with the calc is if you use it as only system, yeah. then you have the problem that you don't know how to dose the other macro elements and you have a problem with the sink and the particles. Mm -hmm. And this is with the balling light system example, you don't have this precipitation. You have a very low one and you can better control uh, your system over long for longer time. Yeah. So what would be a scenario where 
you know, you would be at a really dangerous level with kelp because if it's precipitating some of these elements onto your surfaces, uh, does it take like a big pH swing like downward potentially? Um, that could that trigger some of these things leaching and coming out and and potentially causing issues? This comes mostly later. So the pH go down on the surface. So these mm -hmm. um, the precipitation goes on the surface, goes into the sand, and in this area then the pH go down. So the the uh, phosphates and the organic which you put into the surface and into the sand they will come back. So that's why at the beginning you have low phosphate and low phosphate, and immediately then you have some uh, you have a lot of um, organic phosphate then later in, in the system and you have this hair algae grow also due to the situation that fluorine and bromine will be lowered down massively and mm -hmm. that, then the coral stops to grow the energy is still in the aquarium the light is still in the aquarium and then the algae growing and that was yeah. mostly the end of these aquariums i see yeah okay and yeah you were saying that calcium hydroxide i mean even though it creates alkalinity through the you know chemical process of reacting with our tank water it's lack. Mm -hmm. It's not actually adding carbonate or bicarbonate to the tank, yeah. right? It's a it's a great thing with the bicarbonate, using the bicarbonate proper, and we will come soon out with a system. Uh, Doug and I um, talking long time about and do some testing for a total different way to dosing that things, and mm -hmm. I can promise you this will be changed uh, the reefing world um, massively. Because we find out some things why we have today problems which we don't have 10 years ago, and that's uh, the, the, the type and the way how we dose different type of chemicals into the water. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think in the next two, two, three months, we are ready with that. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Well, I like the idea of something that could change the reefing world. <laughs> and Doug's, Doug's got a lot of ideas and a lot of opinions, but he he's a very smart guy. I'm gonna, I'll have him on the podcast. He, he said I should talk to you first. So, <laughs> yeah, Doug is a great. Uh, Doug is one of these guys who uh, is really great because there's so many ideas and so many passion into the hobby and asking and telling and coming an mm -hmm. idea and be totally disappointed if um, I think I don't know if it's a good idea. So then yeah. uh, immediately go back and into, into the basement and think about it. Like, ah, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I will find a better way. So, <laughs> yeah. so but these That's are. Cool. Uh, He's a really cool guy. I really yeah. like him. Nice. Well, um, that kind of got me thinking too about um, people that are dosing um, sodium carbonate only compared to dosing a mixture of sodium bicarbonate, which is, I mean, I, I assume most balling systems are using uh, for their alkalinity a primarily bicarbonate based. Um, mm. Not or is all, it, no. No. I mean, I don't know if you would tell me the ratios, but I'm curious because... Um, for the last, I'd say, two years, I've been doing 50-50 carbonate to, to bicarbonate. Why? Uh, for the pH benefit of the carbonate. <laughs> you don't have a, a pH benefit for the carbonate, usually. Look, From soda ash? No, not for a longer time. You no. have it with a bicarb. Uh, look, a bicarb has a different reaction if you put it in the water. The mm -hmm. first, what you have is that you get the pH go down. Yeah. And within of a few minutes, uh, it goes up and it provides CO2 for the cords. If you put uh, carbonate in, the pH go up and then down. Mm -hmm. So due to the production of the bicarb of the CO2 and the CO2 releases out of the water to the skimmer and surface, you, at, you will be at the end after the process is gone, you will have a little bit of higher pH. So if a proper way of dosing, the pH will be more stable with B-carb instead of carb. And you okay. don't produce that much precipitation like you have with, with the sodium carbonate by itself. Okay. That's, why we, that's why we never used that. And that's also why it was never used in the original balling systems. Yeah. Later, when people using the sodium carb, because uh, you can dilute more in the water. So these modern balling systems selling other, other names which you have three bottles or four bottles uh, and telling you that you need only to dose this last, that are the carb systems. But uh, it shows that uh, with very sensitive cords like SPS, the success is not that big and not that mm -hmm. long time. Uh, the best way is to dose uh, the sodium B-carb um, on a specific way. 
in my opinion, yeah. it's my experience also. Yeah. And it looks also like the chemistry way, but I can show you that if you'll be interested in, I can show you some graphs of, from some tests and I can show you that a little bit. What is the background there? Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know if you want to send me anything because I can cut stuff into the video or we can, you know, discuss later and up to you. But uh, yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. What do you think? Do you want to send me some stuff now or? Uh, today is not possible. Like no, it's not, in the, not, not in the office, okay. But I send it to you, then we talk. Then yeah, we talk for totally. About. Yeah, totally. Um, maybe even if I'm if I get dug on, I can get you to jump in on the call or something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because um, he he had some interesting things about um, dose timing, um, which I'm sure I mean you probably know what I'm talking about the the alkalinity dose timing being all in one shot uh, in the morning. But I don't want to steal his thunder, so I think we'll wait till we talk to him. But yeah. yeah. Uh, we will, we will we will present something and then we see uh, yeah. what's worked. But, you know, okay. to to know nowadays to to uh, to telling something is the one thing uh, to show proofs and to show proper uh, chemical reaction and proper graphs uh, and a little bit of proof will be more beneficial for the people yeah. than later to understand why we do it differently than maybe it's usual now. Yeah, yeah, and you have quite a few hobbyists that you consult and kind of work with that you 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 will get to try stuff, right? Like you you constantly oh, get yes. feedback from people. Yeah, yeah, we have yeah. a specific group uh, that's the Reefers Club. Mm -hmm. Reefers Club is uh, uh, yeah, like the name is. It's a club of uh, reefers. Um, hobby is to are really deep into the hobby, mm -hmm. and it's a close club, so you. You need to be invited to be into this club and these mm. people they have many different type of aquariums from big to small yeah uh, and they do all the testings like yeah. uh, private people also they know about the risk so not every yeah. test goes well <laughs> yeah you probably feel bad if you make someone's tank do worse hey <laughs> oh absolutely so that that's uh, it's that that's a problem of testing weird ideas mm. but uh, these guys so they have fun of it they report it they know there are a lot of engineers. We have some chemistry there. We have biologists there. Yeah. Uh, some uh, core breeders. Some other companies. Some genetical uh, doctors. So it's over 200, and uh, actually we are 220 people. Okay. Cool. We have also we have also meetings and and so typical uh, club uh, uh, way. So uh, we do Zoom meeting. We do Zoom calls, and for me it's that so important to have this kind of people around me because if you stay the whole day in a coral farm and you talk with people about their problems you also get a little bit blind to go open on your ideas mm -hmm. so your your trend is to go to be safe uh yeah the product and what happens there so and yeah to find out new things means you have to go to risk and you will not go risk in a huge farm mm -hmm. so that's why you need people who are using the product uh, on a way like uh, you alone cannot imagine and mm -hmm. so good products um, we had a lot of I've I had an idea about the coral food in my opinion and on the paper and everything that I study it was perfect mm -hmm. so I buy this product I process it and I was 100% sure this is this is the burner it's one of the best food ever will be on the market mm -hmm. so I try it out and I have some bad effects. Mm -hmm. it's, it's impossible. So maybe something else. I, I was still sure it's, it's perfect. And then I sh mm. ship it out to 50 of the reefers. I ask him, we do test it out. And I, I'm surely I kill about 20 tanks. So, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so the way no. not to do it is only a way of learning. So, yeah. but it was okay. The, the guy say, we know about the risk. Uh, yeah. I, I have Today, I, today now, it was 10 years ago, today I understand why this product never can work. But mm -hmm. I was so enthusiastic, I was so happy to find something, and you know, 10 years ago we had not the knowledge like today, mm -hmm. that I was so sure that this is the perfect food <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that ever, and it was, it was uh, I, I don't like to talk anymore yeah, about Yeah, no, it, no, that's fine, but that's, uh, you know, so one of those... Bad learning from your mistakes scenarios and sometimes the lesson is a little harder than the <laughs> yeah that was know. that was really hard because it was yeah. so unexpected you know because uh, uh, the particle size great everything was great mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but okay yeah. 
today I know why it was a mistake, but yeah, for that's, sure. That's how we learn. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, maybe we can talk about trace elements a little bit. And I know it's hard to um, kind of say specifically which ones, but I, I wonder if you could kind of give me a list of the elements that you think are the ones we should probably pay the most attention to or might sort of have the most impact on coral health. Can I ask you what you understand on trace elements exactly? Um, well, I'm not calling potassium and iodine and those kind of those are more in the major groups i'm talking about the you know the ones on your icp that are the physiologically relevant trace elements and color relevant micronutrients uh so yeah the dynamic elements in those ones okay yeah that's that's also why we create these dynamic elements um mm -hmm. it's the zinc the vanadium the nickel the copper and the molybdenum um these are the most important ones we find surely on selenium and cobalt and chrome and iron, we found some biological effects. But mm -hmm. usually with the way how we run today reef tanks, we have more than enough of these specific, very small elements into the water. So we have usually no lacks of them. Um, but what do you have a problem is in zinc, is in copper, is in vanadium one um, specific relation as a sample. If we use fluorine, and fluorine is not only used as an active element, it's also used as a protecting agent uh, mm. for the corals. And um, the problem is that without the vanadium, the fluorine is toxic. So we need a vanadium mm. that the fluorine can work properly. That's very okay. important. And there is there is, uh, in my knowledge now, and I look on uh, most uh, products in the world, um, half of them using the wrong fluoride and do, doing not the fluoride under this uh, connection and relation that the, that the vanadium is running. So mm -hmm. that's why they don't use it, because the most labs don't uh, can detect them properly, because fluoride is really a problem. So it's not um, the correct. So it's not the some of these other companies. Not saying any names are using a fluorine product that's not necessarily the right kind of bioavailable product for yeah. a tank. Yeah, okay. Definitely. And not only yeah. on fluoride. But this yeah. is what I mean. Uh, it is really to see that uh, the funny thing is that uh, the, the companies growing up from farming and growing up from aquarium mostly have the right one, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. even with not the knowledge. So, but over the feeling of trying out different products, so they find out, oh, when I dose this, I have results. When I dose this, it was not good result. And um, the the first mistake when when the bulling method was developed, the people think about the theoretical reaction, um, how carbonate and calcium comes together, and then mm. they do test on a, on a branch of Acropora and testing the skeleton, what kind of trace element we find in there, and mm. that's what, and then they do calculation, and that's what we have to dose into the aquarium. Yeah. That's why in, 80, in, in, in 94, the 92, 90, in the 90s, 92, 94, this system was developed on this way. Yeah, I can see, I know why already, why it's not the right way to look at it. <laughs> in my opinion, it's uh, too theoretical. And yeah. that's why we have in Europe, uh, even uh, me and uh, my uh, really good colleague, Mr. Balling, we have some years of fight of discussions behind mm -hmm. us. So mm -hmm. I respect him absolutely and I like him and we work close together. So everything's good. <laughs> uh, it's a snowball problem. But during in the 90s and in the beginning of the 2000s, we have had really hard discussions in the forums because I always tell him, look, this is a too specific view of one core. So you need to view on the biology, you need to view on the needs in an aquarium in a total different one. And we cannot go into the sea, uh, checking seawater from Hawaii and say, okay, that's the same like in our reef. Yeah. That's yeah. totally stupid. So I developed then the bunning light system to make it more easy, understandable, more easy to dose, more easy to mix, and not to try to find out the 78 grams of whatever chemistry. Mm -hmm. It was the background. That's also why it caused burning light. Light was easy, make it easy, uh, make it more simple to understand. I see. Yeah. Uh, that was the background, and I call it also balling because um, 
I had really respect of the work of that, what these guys do in these days, because I see that we benefit of it. And uh, that's why we're given a little bit the same name and only the change on it. It would be yeah. maybe easier to, uh, to create an own name, which every marketing guy would tell me that was a stupid mm-hmm. idea. But I must say that everybody in this ages, you are great and a lot of work with that uh, possibilities what we have. So there were not a lot of ICP. We had uh, connection to some um, university machines, but that was not the same like we have today. Mm-hmm. And everybody was with the heart there and everybody's fighting for his idea. And this was the biggest benefit for the reef keeping for the whole world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also why it developed these which elements we put together in which relation to every dosing, which is on the balling system, um, which is on the balling system, the base of it. Uh, mm-hmm. Culture reactors, it's a good luck if you have the elements or not. The CAG, you don't dose any elements and you have mm-hmm. no idea about it, which relation. Um, yeah. The new modern system in the bottles, these are origin. If you look at the recipe, this is our original classic balling system sold for a um, massive high amount of water uh, money. And on the other side, the two part only with the two, two chemicals, you also provide not the right elements. So the balling mm. system is the only one who developed that. And we change it then from the theoretical view from this recipe from 84, we change it over the years to a very specific um recipe for the needs what we find out in the aquariums also with help of all the icp and Mm. the knowledge now about the the coral health yeah and because due to that when we show back to the coral health corals um producing antiparasitic and and, uh, antibiotic um uh, compounds in the skin of the corals to fight against the bacteria, to support the bacteria. And for mm-hmm. that, we need sulfate, fluorine, strontium. So there's some there's a relation between these elements, uh, which the corals need, that they can produce these molecules. Mm-hmm. If we don't have fluorine in, we have way more problems with worms and with uh, parasiting infection as we as we have when we put the um, when we put the fluorine into the water in the right relation to bromine into iodine, it's the same like calcium, magnesium, and carbonate. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and um, the same you, situation with with the dinoflagellates. So for protection, is molybdenum is one of the most important elements. Okay, yeah. You mentioned uh, sulfate, and I, I know you started selling a sulfate um, additive product. Um, yeah. Which I I just picked up. Um, by the way, you should add it to your uh, your calculator on the on the website the mm. elements calculator i don't think it's on there yet um i don't know if it's today but in the next two three days the update okay. is ready and then cool. all the Sounds calculators good. will be updated and everything's ready so so what is some of the uh biological significance of sulfate because i think of sulfate as being kind of i don't know like uh sulfur stinky kind of <laughs> not, <laughs> not something we want <laughs> yeah but that's that's also the same. Sulfate yeah. and sulfur are two different things. Yeah. We have an ICP, we detect the element, which is sulfur. And then we calculate um, the sulfate level, because we know that in the seawater, sulfur is based on sulfates into the water. The difference is uh, S as a sign for uh, sulfur, and mm. SO4, the sign of sulfate. So the same like phosphor is P, and PO4, 3 minus, is phosphate. Mm. Um, there we have the oxygen, and so there's a, a simple calculation, I think, by three, um, which uh, gives then the sulfate level. Mm-hmm. And so the biological role of sulfate. Sulfate is the same like all the other elements. It's part of enzyme production and, and using for different biological roles. There are a lot of them, I think over 90 or 80 different ones. Mm-hmm. What is the problem now? Every of these biological rules uh, or enzymes need a very little amount of sulfate or sulfur. Mm-hmm. So usually by viewing on the pure biological way, we can say it doesn't matter if you have a high or low sulfate level. The experience from coral breeders and for many people shows that under certain level 
of sulfur, we have problems with more parasitic effect, we have more we have problems with the corals, and we have a dying of aphelias, and we have more RTN as we have when we go with a higher level. Okay. Nobody has looked yet, or not many people, only a few have looked at about what happens in the coral skin and what happens in the, in the microbiome, yeah. and what do these bacteria producing to on uh, compounds and toxins to protect themselves. This is not part of the most uh, studies. So there was a study of the skeleton, it's a study of that, but not what But what not the tissue. The yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, and not the that's tissue. half the coral, really. Half the coral is probably, not the weight of the coral, but half of the actual biological mass of the coral is probably the tissue and the polyps. Yeah, so, yeah. and there, uh, this stuff is used and maybe we need a certain amount of elements, which we know also in the production of hormones and, and, and other things that we need, uh, we need an, a molecule pressure. So you need some, you need a specific amount that this, uh, uh, that this chemical reaction starting or the, cor or the bacteria starting with that. Mm -hmm. um, to, but to say nowadays that it would be better to run the, the reef tank about between 950 to 1000 milligrams uh, of sulfur okay. is something which is, at the moment, I would say, pure experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was going to tell you my reading was 776 on yeah. my last ICP. So, and, and it says the range is 850 to 950 is on yeah. the ICP. So you're saying it could go even a bit higher. So I could potentially be having uh, not any major problems, but you would definitely say get it up to that yeah. 900 range. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we have um, we view all over the world some lower readings as we have in the last years. In five to eight percent of all the samples what we get, we have lower readings of sulfate as we have in the last years. We are not sure actually why this happens. Mm -hmm. It started last year in um, in February, March, that some of the reef tanks going down, and since October, November it goes, uh, the curve goes up, so it goes back. Hmm. Uh, we do some testing with other labs. We look around uh, what kind of product they use or specific bacteria is using or whatever. Uh, till now, I must say, I'm not sure what's going on. Hmm. Um, but you've seen just a shift generally in the industry where there's been more, more sulfate. I see that... I see only in the ICPs that we have on five to eight percent too mm -hmm. low, too low sulfate reading, which are not comparable to the tests in the last years. Mm -hmm. I don't see any big changes in salts. I don't see any big changes in products. I don't see any big changes um, in other things. We tested the labs each other, so we sent it to other um, to other labs to do a quality check. Um, we don't see more than one, two percent differences. So, mm -hmm. and at the moment we have, I don't, can say definitely why on this five percent of people, why this happened. So yeah. some of them, they, that's why we do the sulfur stuff. Because mm -hmm. usually if you do water change with our salt and you regularly don't have a low sulfate level. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, but, I wonder. But, but some have. Would um, because most magnesium um, components are uh, tend to be a blend of magnesium chloride and mini magnesium sulfate. So if someone was doing, you know, just using those straight up additives, if they used a primarily magnesium sulfate based yeah. salt for the magnesium, that might support the sulfates a little bit. Yeah, in this case, um, do a little bit. We never used that um, for the last 20 years, but it was unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Because due to food. The balling light system and the food, we don't need to push uh, the magnesium sulfate, and I don't like the magnesium sulfate a lot, those in my reef tank cause it is mostly uh, full of organics and full of elements which I don't want to have in my reef mm. tank. Mm. Yeah. So it's so really it, hard to find good magnesium sulfate. Yeah, because magnesium sulfate is Epsom salts, right? It's yeah. like bath salts. Yeah. So unless it's, you're getting super good pharmaceutical grade, top notch stuff i don't know yeah and pharmaceutical grade in quotes <laughs> yeah but yeah. even even pharmaceutical grade can have a lot of organic compounds because yeah. the pharmaceuticals only say it's good for your blood and yeah. so it's controlled for the potassium and for other parts it means not that it's definitely clean yeah yeah 
Okay. So yeah. that's a little bit the problem. And uh, for magnesium chloride and, and calcium chloride, we find we have here in Europe extremely good and extremely pure uh, sources. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Epsom salts, what I found over the years, it's, it's horrible. That's also a little bit the same with the calc. We have a lot of barium. We have a lot of bad stuff in, in the market, which we cannot use for the aquarium over the time. Yeah. Okay. That's a good thing to keep in mind for sure. Uh, yeah, I kind of back to the trace elements a little bit. Um, and let me know if you're running low on time or anything. Um, uh, no, no, it's all good. So I'll tell you time. about the ones that are consistently depleted for me. Um, and maybe we can kind of, I don't know, come up with a solution. Because I think it's hard to, it's hard to figure out a daily dose or a weekly dose or, you know, a way to, you know, figure out how to get that level up by the next ICP if it's zero on the one before, because then you don't really have any data to go from. You're going by zero to natural seawater, but then you can't figure out the rate of depletion unless, you know, it's, there's something to test. So uh, zinc <laughs> is one of the ones that for me is often zero. Do you use carbon? Uh, not very often. Sometimes I'll just use just a tiny little bit uh, for three or four days and then pull it out. Yeah, but that could be enough depending on the carbon you use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. because carbon, carbon, uh, carbon and zinc loves together. So carbon takes zinc out a lot. Okay. Okay, but let us talk about the carbon or other yeah. elements. You can run the dynamic elements on zero, all of them, instead of molybdenum, and the tank can look great. So as long as you put the cords with the food and uh, you put uh, enough of the trace elements in that the cords have enough of them, they were happy. It means not that you have them automatically into the water. Mm -hmm. You can also let run them about uh, five micrograms, so between three and six, so you know, in this, in this range, or you go on 10 or 20. As long as uh, the zinc, the vanadium, the nickel, the copper, running around these levels and all are on the same level, it's not a problem even to go high. So mm -hmm. there are some zeolite methods who are using a very high amount of uh, the trace elements. The, the reason why you take, uh, the reason why they use carbon and zeolite was to reduce all the unwanted elements mm -hmm. and to dose that one would we need in the right relation to the right amount. So this knowledge is about more than 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, the problem of copper or zinc alone or something like that is when they stay alone. So let me say you have mm. copper 20, but zinc, and nickel, and uh, and copper is, is a zero. So then you have a problem with this element. If everything is on 20, does not matter. It's not a problem. Mm. So you can adjust that and you can check that very easily. So let me say you have zero on your test. And you say, okay, I want to go to two micrograms or to five micrograms is my goal. Then you dose five micrograms, and at the end of the of the week, in the next test, you have another zero. Mm -hmm. Then you know that the minimum, if the minimum, what you need is five, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's a minimum. Yeah. Now you look on your corals, and then you see, wow, they look great. So that means you dose another five. Mm -hmm. The next week and out that you see they still look great. There's no, it's not bad. It's going, it's not going down. So you, you, so you stay on on five. It doesn't matter. You don't need to put it by pressure to, to, yeah. to five yeah. you. It means only that at the moment your system absorbed that zinc and it will be immediately used by cores or by the bacteria. Yeah. There's not enough into the water that it becomes to a relation between the surface and uh, and the water. So mm -hmm. everything, everything is at the moment absorbed. You can let run it for one year. As long as your corals grow and look healthy and gorgeous, everything is good. Mm -hmm. But if you see that the corals, they don't come up, the grow is not that good and the nutrients level don't go down, then you go the next time you go, let me say on 7.5. If you have the next week another zero, you know, okay, it's absorbed by 7.5. You do that two, three weeks, it's still a zero, it's still nothing is, uh, happens into the aquarium. Then you go on 10. And immediately mm -hmm. you will find a day where the, the ICP detects one or two. Mm -hmm. And then you know, mm -hmm. ah, now it goes back to the water. 
And yeah. then you go back to 7.5. If you are back on zero, say, okay, I need a 10. And then you know it. So latest after five, six, seven, eight weeks, you know it. Yeah. And you yeah. can control it. So, yeah, it's kind of a commitment to, um, yeah, and like you say, kind of undershooting it and really observing your tank and your corals and how they're responding. And then, you know, until you do get a reading on the next ICP, and then you kind of build a bit of a foundation of depletion yeah. around that. Yeah. Yeah, and you should never overdose it. Mm -hmm. this, this dosing of nutrients and elements is at the end the same like the fertilizer we use in plants. Mm -hmm. It's you know, if you look on a fertilizer, you see every of these elements and nutrients, what we dose, you see also in the bottle of a, of a fertilizer for plants. It's exactly mm -hmm. the same. The, the problem is, and it's the same with the plants on the cords, and the cords reacting more sensitive to that. If you plant a new, um, if you plant a new tomato plant, whatever, and you give all the fertilizers on top of it, it will grow very fast, but not for a long time. So like every farmer, they start with a little bit because mm. the plants and the corals, they know that they, they, they know how to handle um, a limitation of some nutrients or limitation of elements. Yeah, yeah. So for them, it means, oh, I have a limitation. I have to spread my surface. So then they invest in grow. Then they get more surface to get the nutrients and the elements what they want. Mm. Mm -hmm. If you... Give it from beginning on. We have the problems with the cores, with uh, bacteria and with uh, algae living into the corals, which starting to grow. And this will giving the green boring algae or the cyanobacteria in the skeleton, which mm. we see so often in, in, yeah. in uh, on our corals after one after half a year, one a year. And that's the same. That's the same thing. Like the plants getting gray or brown leaves when we do them over fertilization. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. And that's then the same. So it, at the beginning, and that's also why the balling light system works with this, which at the end, the start of the balling light system gives too low or too less nutrients and too less uh, uh, elements into the aquarium. But at the beginning, we don't have a lot of biomass. Yeah, yeah. So, And so it is a system who will take for keeping SPS and keeping them for a long time, which means stability, very low and very clean stuff, and then adjustable that the, the nutrients and the, the care can go with their grow or with the amount of course you add in your reef tank. Yeah, that's, that's interesting that's that. what you were saying about coral potentially growing uh, or encrusting more, trying to put out more, more of itself uh, in, in a situation where it's actually underfed. Because we always associate growth with, you know, like a coral being healthy and fed well, which I'm sure is the case as well. But um, yeah, I, I never really thought about that. But I, you know, I've wondered about polyp extension too, and and you know, how how do we relate polyp extension to, you know, a coral being hungry, <laughs> essentially? <laughs> yeah, but look, you know that, and I think you have the experience with that. If you mm -hmm. have problems in your reef tank and you go in a limitation, your polyps first reacting, and then they go back and back and back. Mm -hmm. If you go on the other side, you put too much of that things, the polyps go back and some some uh, uh, other reaction, mucus and that stuff, the core reacting by stress. Mm -hmm. If you're in the middle and you don't give them a lot of food and you give them a little bit of food, so they have to catch the whole day, then you have to hold the whole day the polyp extension. Mm -hmm. That's You have this experience. If you think about yeah. what you do over the time and when you have the polyp extension, and then you see, oh, if I feed proper a little bit and a good food, then they push out the, the polyps and try to get everything out. Yeah. Would you if say you there's a, a more the ideal, I, sorry, would you say there's a more ideal time for feeding corals? I don't care. Yeah, you don't care. Yeah, I, because care <laughs> I guess if you were the mindset of feeding at night because more of the axial polyps are out, like maybe they have a better chance of catching it, but then the corals are more trained to feed at night, right? So I must I say, uh, I hate this type of discussions. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is, you know, uh, it is running on numbers. I think corals are so smart and they're so they're excellent made for the environmental they live. And come on, in fact, if 
if there's a piece of food s swimming around, uh, none of these corals have a clock and none of them, if they can catch food, they do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, and it does not matter if, for polyp, does not matter. You can say now on the scientific ways, yes, during the first light, they're in the photosynthesis and maybe we will not disturb them. But I am not sure that somebody explains that to the corals. No. In my view, with my diving, if a shrimp swims around and coming to the polyps, the corals eat it. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't care. At, they don't care. They eat it at <laughs> night. And yeah. I think the night situation that the, core, the polyps are out at night and they catching at night is very simple to explain. Mm -hmm. The plankton goes up at night. So days they're in the deep and at night they come up. And there's also no fishes yeah. at night. Well, uh, yeah, because those axial polyps. polyps are probably a lot tastier than, you know, those are the bigger meaty polyps, right? So <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. why they don't, Surely that whole over the day, the reef is full of fish trying to picking on the cord. So they yeah. put all the things in. So okay. at night when the foods come, they open. But after a short time in the aquarium, and even when we work with frags, the frags learn very fast. And, oh, it's it's 10 o'clock now is food. And the polyps are full open the whole day because there's no fish in. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what happens in the reef. And, you know, um, there's a, such a miracle also is... Um, Put up the current, uh, put the current down uh, during the night. Because at night, it's not that much current in the sea. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Is that the true? Sea, the sea stops during night. Is yeah, it always see, night I, I've always thought that was BS. Um, you know, I've been, I've, I've been on lots of vacations in tropical areas with reefs, and sometimes the ocean's a lot stronger at night. It, it's not uh, consistent. Yes, and <laughs> when at night divers go diving to make night dives. Only when there's no current. Mm -hmm. No, no diver which has a little bit sense, uh, which is which is a little bit intelligence, will go to a night dive when it's full current. <laughs> no, you don't. Do that. That's totally so, not a good idea. <laughs> also, all the hobbyist divers go diving at night when there's no current. So they come on up and say, "Oh, night is night. There's at night diving is nice. There's no current." Mm -hmm. <laughs> it means not it's no current at night the sea don't stop at night it don't care yeah. if mm -hmm. it's current and if you do a lot of visits and i do a lot of dives at night uh where current started and i can tell you that's a very bad situation when there's full current mm -hmm. it's a totally different thing it's night or day for us but not for the courts the courts yeah. at night open they have their food my opinion yeah. don't care food at yeah. day Okay, I like that. Yeah, I mean, you did mention like, um, does it you know, like there's that photosynthesis period when corals, you know, photosynthesis occurs in the zooxanthellae for what is it, four or five hours is kind of the the max or the peak? Is there kind mm. of like, is it something along those lines? I think five, five and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that light outside of that period is more affecting pigmentation of corals? Yeah, it can depends yeah. on the light because. Um, uh, maybe some people don't understand that um, corals creating the light also for protection and for use the light. It depends. Uh, fluorescent effect can be a protection fluorescent, fluorescent effect can be to use in low light areas. So we have always a protection fluorescent mm. and a using fluorescent or using coloration, what corals do. Um, it is a mistake to think that it has to do something with UV radiation. Uh, if UV radiation, uh, if you want to protect, like humans do, we want to protect against UV radiation, mm -hmm. our sunscreen is not colorful. So yeah. Because the, we cannot see UV radiation, so that's not turning into light. Light is that what we see, radiation is that what we don't see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the protection for UV, UV radiation, corals doing the same like we do with uh, specific protein layers. Yeah. And then it will, the reflection will go up and we cannot see it. Uh, the colors will be used and will be a part of the um, um, metabolism of the core. Yeah. But so would you say that metallic pigments are mostly, I mean, it's a tough one to kind of break down, but would you say that metallic pigments in corals are derived or partly generated from some of those trace metals? those dynamic kind of elements? No, no, Or is no. it a combination of things? Is it, is it back, no, you no. know? It's a genetical situation. 
mm-hmm. the corals can do that or not. Um, to do that, some specific elements are necessary, but they are always in the reef tank for some other biological processes. Mm-hmm. So it is not that you, let me say, you put a lot of rubidium in the water and then uh, uh, luckily there's uh, there's a blue fluorescent available. The corals and their type of uh, potioporine, special proteins, uh, which can do the effect. And if everything is well, so if they have the radiation, if they put it uh, to fluorescent effect for protection, so it depends where the protein layers are. Mm-hmm. Uh, for protecting, it's on the top in the cell, and for using, it's under the substantels. So mm-hmm. there are different layers, and uh, if the cores want to use the light, like uh, we can do one example, it's blue light. Mm-hmm. If blue light and the core is living in the deep, so she ta- she gets blue light. The blue light is stronger than the daylight, the usual, so and then the white mm-hmm. light, yeah. but it loses the powers when it go to the deep. Mm-hmm. So what she tries now, she puts now uh, um, a protein crystal under the tails, so the blue light who goes through the the tails will be turning into a little bit less energy color so from the blue goes in a little bit in direction of green or turquoise and mm. will be sent it back and passes another time the tail. Mm. so mm. she can do she can use twice the energy okay interesting so, yeah. but if you have a, a coral let me say like um let me say like uh, like uh, millipora living mm. in uh, three foot or one meter of deep and have the full sunshine power on mm. it Mm-hmm. So that's why they are so colorful on top. That's they they put in the, these crystals like uh, like a sunscreen over mm-hmm. the substantels tails to providing them for too much light, mm-hmm. and that's why they push away the red lights and the green lights which they don't use, yeah. and using the whites and the blue lights then for uh, taking energy. So that's why we have so less blue corals. Uh, yeah. In the reflection, because they use usually the lights and they don't give it up, and the the red light, which is creating a lot of heat, so that's why we have red cores. So they will be, they they send it out and they send it back. That's why we can see them. Mm-hmm. So if mm-hmm. that's like a black color, you know everything is absorbed. Red mm-hmm. coloration, that's what it's everything which we reflect, and that's only what we can see. So yeah. that's yeah. that's why they have the colors. That's why plants are green, so they don't use the green color. So that's mm-hmm. uh, they reflect mm-hmm. it. That's what we see. Okay. Um, yeah. And the elements uh, together, like fluorine, like iodine, like a bromine, molybdenum, they need to protecting them from the from too much light. These are anti-oxidation uh, chemicals. Okay. And for to then the reduction for the nitrate to the ammonia, so that the corals can use it. That's why um, when we talked before the dino problems, what we have is not a problem of uh, nutrients; it's a problem of light. So we have too much light, but too less uh, elements and nutrients that the coral can protect their self. Mm-hmm. So um, there was also some uh, nice discussions. Uh, was Polo Reef was a discussion, so I'll talk with him shortly. That yeah. uh, I never know who was there for visit. I forget the name. Uh, it, there was an explaining about to install UVB radiation lights. So, and mm-hmm. I and I call him and I say how the heck you come to the idea to install UVB lights? Mm-hmm. It's completely stupid. Yeah, but uh, the explanation was everything would come from the sun is nice and it's good and it's it's the nature. It's like, okay, well, it's, everything is good. So while we have a sunburn after 30 minutes when we go into the tropics. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, UVA radiation and UVB radiation is everything, but it's not nice and it have no biological effect. Mm. That means the corals taking a lot of energy to protect themselves in this environmental. Mm-hmm. And this energy, they have to catch food for that. They have to spend the energy in. Um, yeah. It is, I think, after now so many years, it's definitely proved that we don't need UVB or UVA radiation in our reef tanks, which is also okay. for us not a good idea. Because uh, if you, you if you see the ecotech uh, LEDs and that stuff and how what nice cores we can create with that, yeah, yeah, it means not that is there that we need automatically. And on the other side, it is completely stupid because UVB radiation goes about 40 centimeters, uh, about one meter in the water. It's losing about 80 percent of its power. 
In mm. two meters, you cannot detect them anymore. Many corals on the farms in Bali, they're living in three, five, eight meters deep. Mm -hmm. So they have no protection against UVB because they never need it. Yeah. That's all, yeah. That corals make them like the millipora, which grows in one meter deep. They yeah. have some protection again, but yeah. not the corals which are in the deep. So yeah, why we should install lamps for that? Yeah, because yeah, unless you got a tank full of millipora or like super shallow water acropora, then yeah. you know what. It, and and like you say, I mean, it may not even affect the coloration that much, anyways. No. So, yeah, but it, it sounds like they're chasing that rabbit hole a little bit, um, just because like, you know everybody's yeah. chasing that. That that's <laughs> what I mean before. So uh, yeah. that's the same as the trace element. It does not matter if you have five or six. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. The point is, if I have 420 or 480 calcium, that's a point, mm -hmm. but not 420 or 421. It depends on the percentage. And trace yeah. elements can have five or six or four or six. So the testing is not that super, super, super precise that I can yeah. say 5.5, even not when I have an MS. Mm -hmm. It's in the range of five, it's in the range of zero, it's in the range of 10. That's important. Yeah, well, it's pretty tough with these elements that are in parts per billion, you know, when you really think about it. <laughs> it's hard to, it's almost hard to f imagine it when you look at a water sample and you go, oh, we're testing something in this little 15 mil sample, you know, in parts per billion to, a, you know. It's interesting what the machines can do, right? But I yeah. also see that, um, I think we also have the problems now that it's not over the value that people see a number. And not everybody can compare what it means, micrograms to milligrams to milliliters. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they react more emotional on it. So um, at the beginning of ICP, we have sometimes a discussion. Oh, I have strontium in the water. I say, yes, yeah, but that's radioactive. I say, no, not this type of, yeah, yeah, strontium is radioactive. I read it, it was in the newspaper. It's like, no, this is an isotope. This is not the element. So, no. And then you see that they have not the idea what are the different things. So, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. today we have more the emotional effect of uh, copper, of uh, arsenic, which we found very often in one, two micrograms, yeah. so it's, it's not a big deal, yeah. or uh, lead or uh, aluminum. Aluminum yeah. is also a very emotional element. So mm -hmm. the, the, the reaction on that is, is so wrong. So they say, oh, I have aluminum in it. Say yes, you have a zeolites in your system. Yeah, how can I can rid of this aluminium? Say, I'm gonna take your zeolites out. It's mm. not dangerous. It's okay. It's it's particle, so it absolutely doesn't matter. No, no, they must be out. Um, it's a pure emotional reaction and not a reaction based on knowledge. Yeah. Um, so that's why these these knowledge base about all the elements which are right on the homepage on so Fauna Marine. There, why I've written that down to explain to people a little bit what that means when I have a detection of aluminium or detection of arsenic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. after I learned that not everybody want and like to read that many informations, that's why I installed in the supporter. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, then I can go into the deep. Yeah, and I, I've I've been looking deep into the uh, the results and really studying my last few ICPs, but I think it's great. I mean, that's the thing too is like it, it's all depends on the reefer and their how detailed they want to get. You don't you don't have to care about all of this stuff, but if I think Not if you're probably. shooting for you know the best color and that constant quest for better and better looking corals, then um, it's a you know there's just so much information here. And, you know, I, yeah, really, I really like your ICP. So I appreciate what you guys are doing. Yeah. Is there anything uh, kind of on the horizon for your ICP tests? Any new elements being added? Yeah, definitely. Um, I cannot say a lot at the moment. Okay. Um, we undersigned some contracts for new machines. So we have about uh, a different type of new machines and we do some machine connections together. So we will have in the next uh, two, three months, we will have another four new machines on it. Well, so we go over nearby 20 different lab machines now. And we do some changes in the laboratory also in the available uh, for the different biotopes what you what you use. So it depends. You, you see that we're collecting some data like lights, like uh, mm -hmm. different uh, systems. And this will be go into the uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And 
um, our quality support of the testing is based on the software. So what we do now is a little bit, we have an inspection. If you do several tests, we have an inspection and then we test your tank against all the other ones. Okay, that's interesting. So, to yeah. find out, okay, if there is a change, if there's some some elements not in the line with how we expect them, mm -hmm. and then you will get an individual uh, result of that what you have to dose, so it would change a little bit according mm -hmm. to the numbers and according to the results. So I yeah. know what you have, I know your system, I know your light power, and then I can tell you, simply, hey, with your crime, it's better you go on fluorine on, on 1.8 and on 80 micrograms of iodine and not maybe on 60 to uh, 1.5. So mm -hmm. it will be a little bit more individualized and mm. uh, wow. the next update of the uh, alternative intelligence would be really great. So we just yeah. work on it because it's a little bit complex. I yeah. think two months, three months, and then it will go out with that. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, is there any, we can kind of close off here, but any like new products or anything on the horizon you want to mention? I'll give, <laughs> give you the opportunity. Uh, you know, we are shortly before the Intersu. Uh, it's in May. It's the Intersu in Nuremberg. It's the biggest uh, pet show worldwide. Okay. And uh, there's a tradition shortly before the Intersu, we say nothing. So, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they represent all the new stuff. Yeah. Yes, they're, they're coming, a, a few things coming. Um, and it would be not another trace elements, and it would be not. Uh, uh, boring another current or something like that, which we see in the last year so many companies. Now we do something completely new. Um, it has something to do to make the the care of the current more easy, so that we can focus more on the cords and not mm -hmm. need to to have. Uh, yeah, uh, I like the idea of something like to that. To have a look on it, but uh, it's cool. it's software, it's product based, it's software based, and. and yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you'll be at Interzoo and making bringing the new products out then. Yes. But I'll I'll put a link to that in the note show notes on the YouTube and and um, obviously link all of your other products and whatnot. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for the discussion. I I uh, yeah. I think I absorbed most of it, but I'll probably watch it again and <laughs> make sure. Yeah. I thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah. Totally. Makes so, a lot cool. of fun. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, let's keep in touch. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode with Claude Schumacher of Fauna Marin. Make sure you go to faunamarin.de and check out their product line and definitely use their ICPs. I've been using them for the past couple of years and I really find them to be consistent and reliable and the turnaround is really fast. I will link to some of the products we discussed as well as the Fauna Marin Coral Farm for anyone in the European Union that wants to get corals directly from Fauna. If you have any suggestions for future guests, uh, want to just ask us a question, make a suggestion, make a criticism, whatever you want to say, uh, feel free to reach out at beyondthereefpod at gmail.com. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and leave us a review. And if you're looking for high quality aquacultured corals in Canada, please check us out at fraggarage.ca. Hope to hear from you soon.